Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we discuss the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. We pick from the thousands of business books out there and test the author's ideas by comparing them to real-world challenges. With over 40 years of projects between us, we've got quite a bit to compare against. We give you the condensed takeaways, followed by our interview with the author. We know you want actions, not theories, and it is actions that we want to help shape, because that's what the Wicked Podcast is all about. So, Marcus, I've got a confession to make. I only read the book, like, yesterday and this morning. Oh, it should be all, all fresh then, right? So, uh, this time we have uh, Wouter Boon, who wrote Defining Creativity, uh, a small, uh, quick little book, which is why we were able to read it just this morning, I guess, uh, uh, about creativity. And I think a really nice deep dive into the history and a lot of examples around creativity and what it means and a book I think for anyone in any industry to read to have a bit of a feel for get a better feel for the mindset of what creativity is but uh, that's just me what were you takeaways and insights from uh, the book Troy? I, I think the way the book is laid out he puts some really serious foundations in place and it kind of defines the the journey over time you know back to the the artists, you know, of Van Gogh and and Picasso, and through Da Vinci and through you know, Einstein and a number of others, and and the different lenses and the different ways people look at creativity, and I found that pretty good. But then he builds on that into how we're doing things today, how we're moving things into the modern times, and how creativity is is being applied now. And I found that to be really interesting. Yeah, I think one of the things I took out is uh, when he talks about you know, the subculture or the domain and how ideas are allowed into the domain, um, given that he says, you know, we're generally all, most of us are conservative. So actually allowing new ideas to come in is sort of one of the bigger challenges of for, for ideas and creativity to, to, to flourish. That was sort of one of the quotes and takeaways. And that's obviously a challenge that we've seen uh, dozens of times. Yeah, and I, I think right now, so in times of COVID, in times of lockdown, we also having to reassess what does creativity look like when many people are are working from home, when you don't have the ability to to work together as a team in in a space all the time. And I think it's a, it's an important point for for people to understand that creativity hasn't changed, but the way we achieve creativity is evolving. Absolutely, and I think the nice. The nice thought here is as well, especially pulling it back into a, a new team and work dynamic in different spaces is that I think there's a it, there's a parallel between literally anything we do, right? Anything we do and we're checking every day with our coworkers and, and, and people we, 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 we deal with on what we do in our job that might not be, everything might not be creative, but we have the same dynamics when we try to have creative ideas and we just work doing admin or anything else. We often check back with people. We have times where we have to go away and sit down and focus for a few hours. And then we can come back and share what we produced and what we thought with others. And that process seems to be essentially identical to how creativity works and the way Walter describes it to and you want to go and dig down a bit for a few hours, really be focused and evolve and grow something, and then go back and check it if it's if it survives, if it's worth further pursuing, and so on. So it's like how experimentation works, right? So it, it I found it really nice that I see these things that we do that are actually how experimentation works. So we're experimenting every day uh, without knowing and without calling it creative, but did. The, the, the actions we take are actually quite similar. So it shouldn't be too hard for us to embrace a, a better creative process to come up with better ideas for organizations, essentially. Yeah, and uh, you were really kind and kind of showed me one of the tools that you've been using called Miro that allows for that kind of group creativity in a digital construct. Um, or you're looking at some of the enterprise tools like Confluence, which is kind of like a, a giant wiki that, that people can share and, and access as well as all the other various digital tools like Slack, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and how important those are at capturing all of those ideas and capturing the consolidation and the, the bouncing off. 
Absolutely, because that's something he packed up as well around the tools, wasn't it? So uh, it was a smaller note. I think we talked more in some theoretical terms about creativity and how you use tools for it. However, uh, that's that's absolutely true. So now more than ever, we should see the value of some of the tools creative people have been using for our other processes or including more creativity in our other processes. Because I think, and again, you know, designers or creative people, uh, wherever they come from, whatever their background is, I don't think anyone claims that any particular tool is the best tool ever. I think it's all about exploring the tools and what they can do for us uh, in a wider range and and pick the best stuff that works, right? It's not going to be all Microsoft. It's not going to be an all Miro uh, real-time visual boards where we move things about. It's going to be a mix of things, and I think we have to identify the mix for us, what works for you as a team best. Uh, There is no final solution either in what you produce or in the process you're having. It's a constant learning kind of what, what works best. Oh, let's try that and see what it, what different kind of mindset or view it gives us when we look at the same thing yet again. I think that's sort of a really nice takeaway and a really nice value to to, to understand. But you, you triggered one of my favorite kind of stories that I tell people, that when I grew up, um, I learned to play the piano. My mother taught me how to play the piano. And today right. you can give me a baby grand piano and you can put me in a beautiful, amazing concert hall. And all I can do is play notes, whereas my mother can actually <laughs> play music. And so I'm trying to draw that back to the idea of you can give me Miro and you can give me Confluence and you can give me all these amazing tools. And I might know how to how to do everything. I might know every single menu and every single sub menu, but it's the way we use the tools it's the way we express creativity using the tools is where the magic happens. Absolutely. And I think that's 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 one thing I keep telling any organization that does change or transformation. The tools won't make the difference. It's about how you use them, right? And you can actually do the same thing. You can do the same thing with a Google shared document that you can do with Miro. It's a bit less visual, but you can actually work around this. You can still throw photos in it. You can be more visual. You can write more text. You can edit. It. You can you you can you know you can work and shape ideas and have conversations about ideas and solutions in pretty much any tool you want. The question is what works best for you, you know, and that. Just because that team performs performs really well with that particular tool doesn't mean the next team does either. And Google would agree when they looked at um, the big research they did around around which teams are the best performing. It had nothing to do with the amount of information they had or the tools they were using. It was all about soft skills and 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 norms, which means the way we interact with those tools. That's essential. And you know, as as a harsh example, I sometimes. And I might be there because I'm getting a little bit frustrated at times, which is not a great thing to do. But, you know, uh, take a hammer. You can build a house with a hammer and a couple of other tools. Or you can you can, you can, can bash someone's head in. You know, it's all about <laughs> that the outcome is very different. The tool's the same, right? So tools have ranges. And um, as much as I think, uh, I don't think it was... It was not Buckminster Fuller, but someone else saying that, you know, uh, first we built it to put... First, we shape the tools, and then the tools shape us. But that's the thing. And even when we have the tools and they shape us, it's only as much as we allow them to shape us, right? So if I want to use Miro or email only in one particular sense to have one particular conversation, then that's how I'm going to be doing it. But there's a hundred different ways to use this, you know? it's like I remember as well, to make a really long answer here, when Slack came out, and everyone's like, oh, Slack is going to replace email. Well, A, it hasn't. B, when it, when it first came out, it was nicely designed, but because the norms were not established how to use it, it became the same clutter and mess that a lot of emails are and were. And so it didn't really improve the quality of conversation. We brought the same flaws and norms into Slack, and we made the same mistakes, right? Even so, it was a very different tool, but our behavior was the same, right? So and I think those are interesting dynamics for us to figure out and go, it's not just the tools. There's a lot of us in there. And I think that's where we should pay a bit more attention to. Yeah. And and before we give our, our listeners any more unfortunate cues, because we really don't want our listeners kind of hitting people in the head with hammers, why don't, why don't we go straight to the interview? Don't try this at home. Yes, please don't. <laughs> yeah, let's go to the interview. So, uh, hello, uh, Wouter. 
We have your book, Defining Creativity, here today. Thank you for making time and welcome to the Wicked Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We read your book as we always do. It's a, it's a really nice book about creativity and um, that goes to my first question. There are other books about creativity and design and this diff particular mindset. So tell us a bit about why you wrote your book. Well, I guess the, the idea to write a book goes way back because, uh, I don't know, at some point in my life, I thought it would be cool to write a book, um, but I didn't have a subject yet for it. Um, I even tried to write a, a fictional book at some point, but that didn't really work out. And I found out that I'm better in, in sort of collecting information and, and creating my own story around it rather than starting from scratch and, and writing an entirely new story. So um, I'm better, in, I guess, in the synthesis of uh, knowledge. Um, And then I started freelancing in 2008. Uh, I, I worked in advertising for a while, and then I started uh, freelancing as an advertising strategist. Um, and then I suddenly had time. Uh, I had lots of time because I, I wasn't fully booked uh, from the start, as you can imagine. So, and what I always found interesting in advertising is that everybody talks about creativity, but no one can really define it. No one can really explain what it is. If you, if you ask people what is creativity, they will maybe tell you it's something about novelty. Um, but further than that, there's not much explanation. Um, so then I thought it might be interesting to write a book um, for this industry and other industries that really concisely explains what creativity is in a really simple way, but at the same time based on uh, scientific research scientific books books important books about creativity and i thought there is something in between those uh those elements on the one hand being concise and on the one hand being scientific i thought there there, there might be a, a sort of spot where my book could be original um and the funny thing about writing a really short book about a really complicated Uh, subject is that it's quite hard obviously because you have to first dig in really deep to understand uh, a part of creativity uh, and then you can write in it, uh, about it in a simple way so it actually took me a lot of time to write it I, I started I guess in 2008 or so and I finished it in 2014 and that was not just because it was difficult writing it also because I didn't do it full-time I had a job on the side so um, yeah I guess that's so that rings a bell. Yeah, that's br that's brilliant. It's, it's similar similar to I think what a lot of writers find. Um, you know, you do rewrites, you have projects in between. Uh, I think there's this one thing that um, so apart from I think it's exactly that when I read it, uh, it is this kind of concise history and view at creativity. I think that that helps everyone, and it's, it's a nice smaller book, so it doesn't take too long to get through it. It uh, and it's 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 a really good starting point I think for people to look at it and the mindset of what sits behind creativity regardless of what industry you're working in so that there's one thing that that um uh quite stuck out for me because i'm you know we're always looking at how do you apply these things then in industry or in organizations or generally with designers or non-designers on creative and non-creative people and um, i know i started you know i used to work for for advertising agencies as well and, and it's, it's particularly interesting there that when you're in the creative industry how people perceive what creativity actually is and they don't always have an answer and i have the same experience um just a so quick, just, just a quick note mm -hmm. what yes. i found in my book is that there's many different definitions of creativity um and not just official or let's say scientific definitions but also informal definitions so that's also why it's it's such a difficult topic because you can look at it from many different angles but yeah. please please continue but but, yeah, but, but i also i mean in, in my agency experience i find that the whole thing of creativity is steeped in mystery it's intended to be complex and misunderstood so the average customer couldn't do it that's why you're hiring an agency and they almost don't want to tell you about the creative process because that would kind of make it you know much more obvious how they were doing things yeah you could you could say that the advertising agency is as much of a black box for the the layman as as our brain is a black box to creativity good analogy yeah. 
<laughs> That's a really good, good, good metaphor. So, so, so the thing then actually around it is quite interesting. So, one thing I picked up uh, as a quote was uh, in the book. It says where you say, um, regardless of specific roles of the creator, the expert, and the audience. So, around the creative process, a creative domain is an organic structure that also values and adopts ideas as a kind of a super organism. I find that really interesting because it looks into sort of systems around creativity and context of creativity. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, I can. Um, well, the, the, there's a, a few elements that come together in that statement. Um, first of all, I think what is really important to understand when you're talking about creativ creativity is that it's a cultural uh, uh, construct. Um, for example, creativity means something else in, in the Far East, in Asia, uh, compared to how we perceive it in the Western world. Um, so uh, the culture decides or the subculture decides if ideas, novel ideas, are interesting enough to be allowed into the creative domain or the conceptual domain. So... This means that our culture is a combination of ideas and, and it slowly changes. Even if you work, for example, in the scientific fields, there is a body of knowledge that is um, that's regarded as the truth. And people try to sort of with articles try to alter that knowledge constantly. So even that is a culture, you could say. It's a subculture of people. Even, even in the scientific world, people don't like each other. And, and if you write something because I don't, if you write something and I, I don't like you, I tend to not believe what you say or your theory is, is, is flawed. Um, so in, in every industry, you have the kind, these kinds of organic cultures that allow or don't allow ideas to enter the domain. The second part of, of, of this statement is that thanks to uh, digital innovation, uh, we have internet, social media. Uh, we have, for example, WhatsApp. We 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 tend to communicate faster and faster, more instantly, more and more instantly, and we're more connected than ever. So ideas are constantly shared. Compared to a hundred years ago, it's like a bom bombardment of ideas that circulate the the, the globe. Uh, in some parts, some subcultures, some cultures more than in others. Um, but these cultures also communicate with each other, each other, or you could also call it creative domains or, or conceptual domains. All these domains overlap uh, and inter are also interconnected. So if you combine these, the, the first and second element I described, one of a culture that's an organic sort of body of, of knowledge and, and ideas being exchanged constantly, then it becomes... You, you could look at the globe, uh, just as the previous metaphor I made, you could see the globe as a sort of a brain of ideas that, that constantly are, are um, fired at individuals and groups of people. So that's how I meant that. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. I, I think, because um, there's a couple of things you said here, I think apart from the organic culture and the constant working on ideas, or um, as you said... Um, a sub where the subculture decides what ideas are allowed into the domain and that knowledge is challenged constantly. So in the scientific realm, and I'm saying that because I used to work over at the Naturalism Museum where there's a lot of science scientists working and mm -hmm. you know how they publish ideas and how they challenge ideas there is quite an interesting uh, uh, area to look at. And that exists the same in the creative domain or basically wherever ideas are, right? So, so how do you feel about... How, how good that is and how that iterative process of everyone challenging, challenging each other maybe more now, what do you reckon that effect is or how, how beneficial, is that beneficial to us? The fact that we constantly exchange ideas? It, it's, um, you could say that because of that, innovation goes faster and faster. Um, the, 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 the process of innovation is largely based on the exchange of knowledge. Maybe not when an individual is writing a book uh, in his study, but when you when you work on complicated creative collaborations, um, the exchange of knowledge is very important. Um, 
but there's also another part of, I guess, the, 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 the fact that innovation goes faster, and that is the fact that uh, knowledge is democratized and also the tools, the software to do something, to apply this knowledge. Uh, for example, you have everyone ha nowadays have, has access to 3D printers. Um, you can upload something that you've designed on your laptop and then you can print it. Whereas uh, 20 years ago, you had to make a mold and you had to, it was a very expensive uh, process to make a prototype. So, uh, but, but even the funny thing is even the, the democratization of, for example, having a 3D printer, even that is based on the exchange of knowledge because you can upload an idea to that, uh, to that uh, printer and that's how you now suddenly have these really complicated or intricate tools uh, you can use them and and that's how you can not just have an idea but also execute it more easily well, can i can i spin off on that a bit of course um, Within an organization, I think that one of the challenges that we're having, based on what you said, and, and, and I agree with it, is it's the flood of information. And it's understanding how, as an organization, you can A, capture the flood, B, start trying to process you know, the signal to noise ratio, because some of the ideas are just really out there and really don't contribute at all. And some of the ones are the ones that you absolutely have to have in the dialogue, in the discussion that actually kind of incrementally move things forward. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how do you handle, and I, I've got my own little mini cast called the WTMI mini cast because there's always way too much information. I mean, how do you deal with yeah. this, this environment? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting point. I think one of the qualities of someone who is creatively successful is being able to, I guess, separate the, the, the interesting uh, information from the bullshit. Um, I, I remember there's one quote, and I, I think it's, it's by Dyson, who, won, who once won the Nobel Prize. And I think he said that the, 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 how, how to be successfully creative is, is have many ideas and just um, only pursue the good ones. So... It's also saying no to bad ideas. And um, I think, let's say the bullshit raider, to call it, to call it that, um, I think that's largely based on, on experience and intuition. Uh, so, so once you've submerged yourself in a creative domain for a long time, you intuitively start to feel what information is interesting uh, and what information is either something you've read before but discarded or something that just doesn't sound right. Um, so I think uh, it's difficult to, to, uh, to, to separate the, the, the valuable information from the, from the bad information, but it, I think it, it comes with experience. It's, it's similar to a child roaming the internet and not knowing what is real and what is fake news. It's because that the, the child hasn't got any experience with, with separating real from fake information. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull three ideas all at once out of your book. And I'm going to ask you to kind of now apply them to what we're talking about. One is that an idea is only an idea until the domain is ready to hear the idea. And two, the concept that ideas that are really terrible today might be seen as much better you know, in 10, 20 years time. And three, that the fact that the experts, the gatekeepers of those ideas as being good or bad are inherently conservative. And it takes them time to get comfortable with you know, this kind of new idea. So if you apply all three of those to this decision process across this glut of information, does that change anything? Yeah, I'm just trying to, to connect all the three points you just mentioned to the answer. Um, I think to, to start with the third point you mentioned, uh, or the second and the third point is uh, that the domain is sometimes slow to change. Uh, that's because cultures are, are slow uh, in change. And that is because we're 
conservative by nature, not just the experts that guard the domain. Um, although the reason why the gatekeepers are conservative is because they know the domain so well and they easily discard bad information. And that is the information that doesn't really fit in the, in the, in the structure of knowledge. Um, there, there is a theory that says that when you become t- too much of an expert within a domain, then you too quickly discard information that seems invaluable uh, at first instance, but, but is more valuable when you look deeper into it. That's, that's exactly why in the scientific world, sometimes it takes for new ideas to actually sometimes, and I think that might happen less today uh, compared to uh, 50 years ago, but sometimes it, it, it has happened that articles were written with new theories that were very valuable um, and they were only rediscovered, uh, let's say, 5, 10, 15 years later, and then all of a sudden embraced by the entire scientific community. Um, you also see that with the painter Van Gogh, um, the Dutch band painter, uh, <laughs> I can proudly say the Dutch painter Van Gogh, who, um, who when, he was, when he died, his, his, his works were worth nothing they were only bought by his brother theo who was a art uh, um, dealer he bought all of his work and he sponsored him because he believed in him and only when only just after when van gogh died all of a sudden his style of painting impressionism became the trend so to say so then all of a sudden his work started to climb in climb in value so um Sometimes the culture is just not ready for a new idea. And sometimes the culture is too conservative to embrace uh, new ideas. Does that, does, that answer, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I mean, the, what, what we're always trying to do is we're trying to drag this back also to practical. What can business leaders and teams and organizations do today? to actually apply some of the ideas that we're talking about in practical steps. I, yeah, I, I think, think, I think, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So if I, if I could just add a little bit to that, cause I think uh, there's yet again, a lot in there that's really valuable. Um, I think that's absolutely true what you're saying. Cause there's also um, interestingly enough. So in about a few weeks, we're going to interview Joe Pine who wrote the experience economy where he talks about new experiences being designed around brands. And he wrote that book like back in 99, and he's just been re-releasing it, I think, beginning of last year. Mm-hmm. It's been literally 20 years. And mm-hmm. the whole idea of experience being a new thing to do, it's not new because it's 20 years ago. Because he, 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 took, he took the example of Starbucks, between McDonald's and Starbucks, to say, I either just buy a coffee is all I get. I get it in like a minute, and that's the service I'm getting. And now I'm getting an experience, which is over at Starbucks, which is you know like Italian-style experience kind of coffee, that was a big leap back then for companies uh, to embrace. And it took 20 years for his work to be sort of recognized. That's 20 years. That's immense, right? So, but, so it, but when, I, when I then turned that into uh, looking at organizations and looking how creativity works within organizations, and we know a lot of companies are really trying to be innovative and maybe not even inno- innovative. I think at these times, companies have to be just smart to get themselves out of or accelerate uh, where they are now to where they want to be maybe in a year because this year has been absolutely devastating to many. Um, so they need to, to come up with new ideas and bigger steps, not conservative steps, but bigger steps faster. So how do they do that when an organization per def- by default is very siloed? Um, there's established voices of conservative ideas and Uh, perceptions of what's real Mm -hmm. uh, that are still quite strong and say well you know what we're going to do we're just going to cut a lot of people and uh, 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 minimize that and do that and do the same product that we did before whereas other voices have been around already for a while Mm -hmm. whenever innovation is talked about saying well actually we can provide a wider service or an actual experience or this and that which creates more customer value and that might get us the money back which is lost Mm -hmm. over the last five months so internally I found a lot to make a really long question here is that 
Sometimes that required new models of measuring things and evaluating ideas internally. And maybe my question is this. So what's your experience with ideas in companies when you say between maybe some extreme case of the creative agency or advertising being the idea people and going, if I sell this idea, I sell it. And they will buy it because I'm a good salesperson for ideas, which is this individual, individual driving an idea to be accepted uh, in comparison to the collaborative effort that, for example, service design brings often to the table, say, hey, this is a collaborative effort. It's business capabilities and the customer needs that we're trying to design for. Uh, they all have to be taken into account. And then we turn that into some model or measurement. And then we can make a decision based on what we measure, based on insights and need that's out there to decide if an idea is good or not. Mm -hmm. So those are different approaches, you know, from a very individual driving this through. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a creative person. It can be a non-creative person as an individual saying, that's not a good idea because I know, because I say so, mm -hmm. in comparison to a more collaborative approach. So what's your experience around these two extreme of how to maybe be able to adopt ideas that are beneficial? Yeah, th there's... Um... There is a bit of a paradox there because um, the, the, on the one hand, you need visionary people um, who see things that other people don't see, who, who can, as, as it were, look ahead in time and see where the world is moving to, while others are still sort of looking maybe slightly backward. Um, for that, you need like vision. You need um, uh, you need a big ego. You need also you need stamina, and, and you need uh, also convincing power to to convince other people. This is, I guess, what the big egos have that have dramatically changed the world. Uh, think uh, Thomas Edison or, or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. These kinds of um, typical uh, creative achievers. Um, so you need those people to, to, as it were, push our, our society forward. On the other hand, when you talk about complicated creative collaborations, um, or sorry, when you talk about complicated innovations, you need to collaborate with others. So all of these individuals I just mentioned always ha have had a lot of experts around them because they cannot see every angle of the creative process um, so you need to be two things to be successfully creative as, a, as an organization i think you need one at least one or a few people uh, at the still at the top that sounds very traditional but you need someone who is leading who has a vision and you who points who leads the way as it were but he also has to sort of trust the collaborative process and and he also has to be able to to partly delegate the the leading of the process um and when you try to innovate as an organization um you have to sell your products uh to the to a customer and and the the human race is generally uh, is not very keen on changing. We we like to stay the same. So some people, a, a ha handful of people, is very innovative. They constantly like change. But but the culture, the people, they they like things as they know. Uh, they like to stay the same, basically. So, um, for example, I was leading a workshop yesterday uh, about the future of urban mobility, and the funny thing is, we talked about all these really innovative ideas uh, around the future of urban mobility. But many times I heard the experts in the room say, yeah, this is really interesting, but you know what I experienced uh, in this and that project or this and that pilot is that people just doesn't, don't want to change their behavior. So, so to, to, to cut it short, uh, on the one hand, you need people that, push ideas forward uh, on the other hand you need there's a, a collaborative uh, process of people uh, sort of following you into novel directions but even in organizations they are like mini societies so even there you have people that can sort of sabotage the process because they don't believe either in the direction or 
uh, going forward full stop. They just want to keep doing what they did because it works just fine. So um, that's a long answer, but I hope it makes sense. No, that's great. That's great. Uh, I th and I think that um, it's funny because we did sort of the same thing um, a couple of years back with, with, with a project around Nissan about mobility as well. And I think there, so, so we looked at the time at electric bikes and adoption of electric bikes. So very simple around, you know, how to design around that and the people are using it. And we had a lot of conversations around um, not just how electric bikes work in, in London, for example, but obviously around Nissan still mainly being in the car business and what does it even mean and what does it mean to be in, in, in transport? Because I think at the time they identified already that, you know, it's not just about the cars. The cars are not the future. Um, Uh, the bikes play a role, but there's buses and tubes and everything and everything else. And people have a particular way to go about these things. And actually, they don't want to have one mode of transport to solve everything. Mm -hmm. And there was a complex answer around behavior. Who behaves how? You know, who prefers what? The main thing we actually found, and that was even more interesting, was that... Mm -hmm. uh, so when you talk about specialists, so we had to go out and we just had to... We weren't specialists on electric bikes. I had never ridden an electric bike at that point. Mm -hmm. So we got on one and realized it it, it it rides itself very differently to a normal bicycle. Mm -hmm. And no one knows this, right? So behavior is totally connected to, do you even know how that feels? So it, it, it got quickly into the space of, actually, it doesn't matter. As long as we get someone onto an electric bike, they will finally realize what the difference is mm -hmm. and then hopefully like it because it's a really, actually really great experience for a lot of people. Um, when you have that mode or helping you cycle, um, I, I guess that was sort of the thing. Or, or, sorry, that was sort of the thing around behavior, where you go, okay, you got a specialist, you bounce it back, and you you, you do this back and forth between reality and checking with. And maybe my question is, are you therefore saying that do we need maybe a different new kind of ownership for creativity uh, of more than just the creative people, so to speak? Uh, do you think that would contribute, or how 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 Do you think that could work or you think well, that's important? Well, I, I think uh, creativity benefits greatly from the right and for creating the right environment. Um, so it's not just about the people who wear funny socks or have um, colorful glasses uh, on their head. It's, it's, it's about creating a surrounding where people can easily interact and where you don't have silos and, and where you sort of implement processes where uh, and a culture where, where people exchange ideas and not, are not vain about their ideas. Um, as I said, you need, you need one big ego maybe sort of to lead the way, but you also need to facilitate the, the creative collaboration and, and to To, to value all the, the, the different experts, even if they're mini experts in a certain field, to, to sort of chip in their two cents and, and maybe uh, use the knowledge they have and you don't. Does that make sense? It, 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 does, it does make sense. It's, it's getting that balance right. Um, kind of moving on from your urban mobility thing, in the times of COVID, you know, urban mobility is, is a big part of that. And lockdown is a big part of that. One part in your book talks about the fact that some ideas are best created with a lot of introspection. Other ideas, even with introspection, don't get disseminated without some level of extroversion. You talk about Picasso, the fact that he was much more kind of socially connected. Um, and I have another whole group of friends and they talk about the future of serendipity, you know, because serendipity is that accidental conversation that happens outside or next to the water cooler or, or at the pub. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen as frequently. How can organizations kind of, you know, prepare themselves or adjust their ways of working, not just so that home working is possible, but to allow for that kind of serendipity sort of creativity to continue to drive cohesion within the organization and new ideas. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, I think There, you, you can actually divide, divide your day uh, in, in work that you can do on your own uh, that's very focused and, and work that you do socially. Um, and the, the obvious example of that is a meeting. Um, 
So people know, thanks to COVID, how, how you can maybe better divide those two things. Um, you do a set of meetings and then maybe you do something else and then you do your own thing without being disturbed by anyone. Um, so you can do the one thing you do socially, you do, uh, you can do in a building because obviously meetings are more comfortable, uh, doing physically when you're actually together. Uh, and, and the other you can do at home and you don't need an office for that anymore. The thing is that, um, people, People like to go to an office because it's it's social. Uh, also, maybe because they don't want to be at home all the time. Um, but the other thing is that uh, for these serendipitous encounters, uh, you need to be together. So I think the future, uh, how we could deal with that is that you, you, you still have to sort of facilitate this serendipity somehow. Uh, in, in my book, I give an example of... Um, Steve Jobs be, being uh, the CEO of uh, Pixar at some point, and he designs the new head office with with um, an atri atrium uh, in the middle of the building, so that all the different specialists within the building can encounter each other, can, can serendipitously have exchanges of information on that on that uh, in that atrium, as if it's the let's say uh, the big square in the village where everyone sort of meets. Um, so he actually, uh, he created the art architecture to make that happen. So I think the challenge will be for, it, let's say if COVID has changed the way we work, that we start to work more at home, is the challenge is to sort of make sure that people at home do the things they can do well uh, on their own, or maybe, in Zoom meetings, if it's just about status or these kinds of boring, th boring things. But you also need to create uh, moments where people come together. Um, and I don't have an answer for that, how that works. But I think that's how you have to separate these two kinds of work. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the big challenges that we're figuring out right now is how do you create those, those magic social moments yeah. that have some level of opportunity for serendipity, creativity, uh, et cetera, while, as you also point out, having the, the ability to clear the decks and focus on particular single projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's interesting because um, um, a couple of weeks back, we did a, uh, a bit of a survey around working from home, asking people how they feel and what the changes are they perceive. And I think, so one that stuck out that goes right into what you said, earlier about her is the um you know people like to check back the social aspect you know and when you actually look at it it seems that what came back from the information and the way they talked about bouncing things back off people every day is that everyone seems to be de-risking or fact checking or just checking uh what they want to do if it's right or if they have to do more or whatever Mm -hmm. with other people all the time you know and we do that a couple of dozen of times a day when everybody is around and that seems to be why everyone loves apart from the socializing and the bonding but bonding is a bit of confirmation i belong here and what i say is the right thing and yeah bring value but, but right I, and they seem to be doing that over the day right but i do think you have things like slack and other other means of communication i think for for quick checks with your colleagues that's Fantastic. You don't need to be physically in one room. Um, but for the serendipity, uh, either you need a more smart social medium um, that maybe combines instant communication and, and visual uh, interaction, um, or you just need to be in the same building every now and then with um and, and not just for a brainstorm obviously because I, I think for a brainstorm definitely you need to be in the same uh, building or not definitely you can do it online but it's it's just it's more organic when you do it uh, physically in the same room um but also well at, as you started the question with for serendipitous encounters it's you cannot it's really hard i think to um to stimulate them in, in a social medium. Mm. So I, I completely agree. I think the one word that I'd pick up on is the word room, 
And I think I would change that for the word say space. So yeah, yeah, you, that's you, fine. Yeah, <laughs> because the space might be an outdoor space, it might be an indoor space, it might be a virtual reality space. Yeah, but you need to have people in the same space for that kind of that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, true. I wanted to to move the conversation on because you know hard to believe, but we're we're actually closing out and running out of running out of time. Mm -hmm. But um, it says you know the broader your knowledge base, the, the the bigger your chance of coming across something that's useful um, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in conceptual domain. And we we hear a lot in organizations and in recruitment in those kinds of areas about I shaped people versus T shaped people. Yeah. I think one of the reasons that Marcus and I have such really good kind of debate and dialogue is we are both T-shaped people, but with different, different breadth. So his experiences and my experiences are both very broad, but there's not a huge amount of overlap. And so when we get together, we, we really bounce all of our experiences together off of ideas uh, and to come up with new questions and, and new thoughts. They're kind of how we came up with the Wicked podcast based on on his book. Uh -huh. What do you think about I-shaped people versus T-shaped people when it comes to creativity within an organization? Uh, I think the answer is relatively simple. You, you need them both. Um, uh, I, I always remember this example of um, when Bill Gates started Microsoft. Um, I guess he was one of the, those first coders that we all quintessentially know now that sleep be beneath their desk and um that if, if you see the, the the film the social network about uh, is that the title of with um mark zuckerberg uh founding facebook a really nice nice movie by the way um you you see him wired uh, or something I, I don't know they have a term for that he puts in his uh earplugs and starts working has loud music on and he just he's coding and he is not to be disturbed i guess that's the kind of focus that could be a metaphor of the focus you need when you're innovating. You need to, you need trial and error. You need to work and work and work, and you need to be very persistent and have stamina. Um, th so, so that's very important. You need, let's say, the nerds, um, and I mean that in a positive way. You need the nerds to really find out how something can work the right way. Uh, but then again, you you also need the more, um, let's say, the not the, the the broader people who can connect ideas and he, who can also connect outside of your company, maybe to specialists that are new to the game or, or to, to your game, um, and and that's I guess the T-shaped person is the open mind that connects to other ideas and is social, uh, and maybe um, uh, yeah, uh, suddenly. Uh, thinks we should buy this small company because it could it, uh, it could reinforce our own business. Yeah, so you, you actually you took the T and the I into a completely additional dimension instead of just okay, knowledge. Maybe I understand. Maybe I understand that. No, the, you, you, you understood way. it correctly. The, the T is breadth of knowledge and the I is depth of knowledge. And you also could took the T as breadth of engagement and I as depth of, of focus. And so yeah, you, it, you, you, you had another layer, which I thought was great. I think, yeah, I think the T, if you want to relate it to creativity, I think the T is the open mind uh, and, and uh, the I is the focus. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's great because when you, when you actually talk about it and we go, you talk about something we um, have another question for, which is um, failure, right? And it's a bit of our stack and fair to look at uh, if you especially in, if you're in a creative process or in any other process you know you have to yeah you, you have to you have to be able to fail in order to learn um and, mm -hmm. and failing is learning as well and it's so there's a positive value there that a lot of organizations don't necessarily always see or find too much of a risk or don't seem to have time for um how do you how do you how do you look at failure mm -hmm. yeah which is you know, admittingly, a really bad word. We might, there might be better words for that in the creative process. But um, if you can talk, maybe sort of as a, as a last uh, conversation, um, last question, yeah, about about that, yeah, yeah. 
I, I to, to me, but maybe that's because I work with creativity innovation a lot. To, to me, the fact that failure is part of the, 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 the creative process is, is very obvious. It's, it sounds like a truism. Uh, and I think it's even at, at this point, it's, it's popular to say for CEOs, we should all, all also be able to fail and uh, failure is part of the process, etc. Um, but um, it's not always in the in the in the culture or process. It's not incorporated in the culture or processes uh, of the organization. Um, and there's let, let's say if you, if you, if you build a prototype or you do a pilot or you try something as an organization for a new product or a new process or a new business model. You what I think what often happens is that there's only budget for one try or maybe a second or at some point like I think organizations are impatient with making things work um, and the, the larger the corporation grows the more important it becomes to make money the more efficient the processes become and the more homogeneous the the culture is. That's all in favor of an efficient, uh, profitable process. Um, so that's why startups, they are small and agile and they can change and iterate. And when you fail, you try again. There's not much money involved. So failing is not very expensive. So I think, I think it's, it's hard for larger corporations to, to really embrace that. Um, except for maybe paying lip service to the fact that failure is important. Um, so I, I, I think, um, and, and I know that this is a challenge, but for, for an organization to really embrace failure, you just have to, um, you, you really have to implement it or incorporate it in your culture and processes. And, and um, you, don't, you shouldn't fire someone when he fails on a project uh, and you should maybe the, the one thing you do is, is ask him to sort of write a report on the learnings and how we, how you can apply them in future projects or something like that. And, and that's, that's so often the way that we talk about it is failure is only failure. If you didn't learn or grow from the result of the process and with regard to whether people are fired or promoted, a lot of it comes down to how are they being measured? Are you yeah. being measured on, you know, incremental return on investment or are you being measured on the fact that you're moving the company forward and understanding those goalposts before you start is so important? Yeah. And, and what's also funny, funny about the, the, the process of trial and error is that, um, and I've experienced it most recently, I wrote a, uh, I wrote a brand document for a company, uh, which sort of defines the company with uh, brand values and these kinds of elements. Um, and part of the my brand document was sort of not used anymore. And I, I was like, shit, I didn't, you know, it was not spot on my document. And then and then my, my client told me, no, 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 it, it was the process was what enriched our knowledge. So even mm. if if we don't apply everything, every part of it, you help us sort of think in a, in a, in a certain direction, and and that's that's how the creative process works. Without knowing it, you enrich your knowledge, you become more knowledgeable, and and you can intuitively make the right decision next time. Um, so it's it's of course it's it's as it's part of life. It's 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 part of how an organization works. But I guess not every organization understands that it's that important. Yeah, um, I do have one last question, and I think it's it's a it's a nice one to kind of tie it all together. Um, I'm reading directly from your book. Uh, During incubation, we take our focus off the creative process to the knowledge um, we we gathered and let it sink in and digest, and then let the unconscious begin to organize it. And, you know, we, we have such great information from, from guests like yourself about your book and it all kind of soaks in kind of overnight. Um, as strategists, we all understand the fact that a lot of our work for our clients happens at, at strange times when our, our unconscious mind reveals to us the insights that are, 
that it's been processing while we're walking around the park or while we're off kind of doing other things and where mm-hmm. our, our unconscious mind doesn't always work kind of from, from nine to six. Um, that's last... very, that's very nice about our unconscious mind. Yeah. It works yeah. while we're, while, while we sleep. Yeah. Yes. Um, so any last thoughts that you'd like to share with our guests that they can kind of let their unconscious mind kind of work on. So when they wake up tomorrow, they're, they're, they're better in their own organizations when it comes to creativity. Well, uh, to tie into that example, um, and this is a practical tip. It's it's not something maybe that um, it's, it's maybe not something that should soak in, but something that you can actually sort of process in your prefrontal cortex. Um, I think the tip uh, is here that it's it's valuable to to work on different projects for short periods of time. And uh, let your so work together with your unconscious brain. So um, uh, what I always think is a very good example is that sometimes you're trying to write an email and you can't find the right wording or the the tone of voice. You have a hard time formulating that email. Um, What is the easiest way to solve that problem is just go to the coffee machine, get a coffee, and you walk back to your computer and suddenly the, the, the phrase is there and you're like, oh, that wasn't too hard. What happened is, is that your unconscious mind was still sort of turning the problem around and trying to see a way to formulate it. So you consciously have uh, all the elements of the email, you thought about it and you weighed them and you tried them in your head, but they didn't work. And then your unconscious mind finishes the problem. So while focus is good, eh, while coding for three hours or eight hours uh, at one go can be useful, sometimes it's more useful and more effective to take shorter periods of time and switch between projects so that your unconscious mind can do some of the work, the hard problem solving for you. So that's a long answer, but um, yeah. (laughs) I'm a big fan of the Pomodoro timers that you see, which Mm -hmm. kind of give you cues on focus and then cues for for short breaks to to allow just that. That's exactly uh, how that works. Although I would hate to work with a timer, but um, (laughs) I I like to do it more organically. And, and, you know, like knowing what to do is not always the same as as actually doing it. So I'm not saying that I'm a a great... uh, um, I'm, the, I'm the right example for it. But I, since I know it, I sometimes walk away from a project when I cannot fix it. And then usually the answer comes. I think I think that's a really great thought and I can relate to that from a creative perspective because I'm the same, you know. it's it's that's, And I wonder if that has something to do with uh, um, a lot of so-called creative people um, to end up working late nights, suddenly getting up going like, I have an idea and then working on something with more focus for two eight, for for two hours and in between you sort of do other things in order to let your brain play with things. I think that's 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 generally I think I think it's really good advice because uh, they say you know if 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 you work too hard and too focused for too long your brain gets tired and actually creative thinking diminishes. So they they've they've scientists have proven that to be to be to be the case. So you know the harder you work too focused for too long the less good ideas you're actually having, right? So, and that's a good thing to break this up a little bit. I think I think in these times in particular where there's going to be lots of stress on us for the next year or more into deliver, deliver, deliver better, better stuff very, very quickly. Yeah. Take a break, take a walk, take yourself out of the, maybe the context, just go have someone, go somewhere else for lunch, go somewhere else for a walk, talk to if, someone. If, if I can add one more thing to that, I, I, I recently uh, interviewed Ben van Berkel, who's a Dutch architect, and he, he works around the globe uh, putting up these amazing skyscrapers, uh, etc. And um, he told me that like, when he uh, looks at the way we work in the Netherlands, which is quite, let's say, healthy hours, um, compared to, for example, the United States, he said, like, also, like, people when they work too hard, they make mistakes. And he said, I, he's, he told me that he, and he is a really like a strong creative mind. He, he told me that he, he works shorter days than ever, but more effectively. And he, he, um, 
he said it's so it's so much healthier to work let's say a six hour work day uh, you're probably much more effective and and in connection with creativity you also have more time to uh, incubate I think that's a great thought. It's a great, great story. And, and uh, also because it says, you know, effectiveness ver- uh, versus efficiency. And I think that's, 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 there's a key value there for yeah. us to look at. Wonderful. Walter, it was absolutely wonderful, beautiful to talk to you about creativity and your book. Um, thank you so much for your time and being with us. Yes, Thanks. Walter. Thank you very much. Very well done. No thanks at all. Uh, it was my pleasure. And uh, yeah. Uh, Good luck with the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. You can find all relevant links and a way to contact us in the description. And please like, share and subscribe. And we hope we see you next time.